Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we really do appreciate your time today. My name is Shane Collin with Smith Pump Company. Welcome to our webinar about vertical turbine pumps, determining the repair, the reconditioning, and the replacement. If by chance you are disconnected today or dropped off for any reason, um, please come back on. Uh, please sign back in. You really don't want to miss what's presented today. For courtesy to the speakers, for courtesy to the speakers and others, please keep your microphones on mute. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the Q&A feature on your screen. We will have time at the end of the presentation to address your questions. These are the presenters for today. As I said, my name is Shane Kyle. I'm out of the Fort Worth office, and I'm a sales engineer for the Texas Northeast Territory. My territory covers Dallas County and counties heading northeast towards Texarkana. Other speakers today that will have presentations are Granger Smith and Jason Popko, and I'll allow them to introduce themselves when their presentations come up. As far as our agenda today, I'll give an introduction to Smith Pump Company for those that are not familiar with us. I'll go through the process of defining repair, recondition, and replacement. I'll then turn the time over to Jason Popko, who will give the paths of repair and recondition and replacement and how we do it at Smith Pump. And then Granger Smith will then address us with a repair and recondition examples. We have a few poll questions that will take, take place during the webinar for your participation. And then we'll follow up with some uh, some, with a summary of key points, and then an opportunity for Q&A. So a brief look and introduction to you of Smith Pump Company, for those of you that are not familiar. Smith Pump started back in 1962 in Waco, Texas, founded by Thomas Smith. Our employee base today is about 75 people, still headquartered in Waco, with branch offices in Fort Worth, Austin, and Houston. Our Austin branch also serves the San Antonio and South Texas areas. We cover the entire state of Texas and Oklahoma. The Smith family is still a strong presence of leadership for Smith Pump, keeping us a family owned and operated company. Now a little bit more details about our company. Pump repairs and reconditioning services is a major part of what we do. All locations have shop services for all types of pumps. We provide engineering services. We have on-site technical services for pump removal and installations, including on-site diagnosis and condition assessment. We have a UL listed control panel shop for panel construction, and each of our locations has warehousing for pump parts. Our Waco facility is our primary manufacturing location. We are capable of fabrication to meet design specifications using state-of-the-art tooling. We can repair and recondition pumps to meet or exceed OEM requirements. Our presentation today will highlight some of this capability. Our field services team is available for site visits to pull, install, and inspect pumps and motors. Our Fort Worth shop has a motor repair and rewind capability for vertical, horizontal, and submersible motors. Smith Pump is an ISO 9001 certified company. In sales, we are proud of our vast product line capable to meet the needs of the municipal water and wastewater pumping market. Smith Pump is a complete pump company offering pump products and service excellence for nearly 60 years. Please visit our website at www.smithpump.com to shop our online store and learn more about our products or call us direct at our 1-800 number to speak to a pump, uh, Smith Pump representative. We are here to help. So that's our commercial. So let's get started. So what's the difference between a repair and a recondition? Look at the pictures below. You can see that there is a problem. Obviously a repair is needed. One example is a quick and easy fix. This is slightly exaggerated but it illustrates a repair. A repair is when a broken piece of equipment needs to be fixed or replaced in order to operate again. On the right, 
is a recondition. A recondition is when the process of restoration is performed on the equipment beyond just a repair. A repair. It requires detailed attention to all the components using precision tooling, measuring for tolerance, tolerances in critical areas and premium workmanship. And then final assembly to meet or exceed the manufacturer's original performance conditions. This is gonna be our focus for today. Because vertical turbine pumps are more complex, we focus our attention today on defining a repair and a recondition associated with them. So when the process starts, it's like, how does this process start with us? Typically, we get your phone call. And when we get that phone call for a vertical turbine pump service, we ask what, is, what the problems are with the pump to the best of the knowledge of the person calling us. It's important for us to begin the communication that will help the process through. These are the four areas of information that are critical for us to begin a profile about the pump. Who is the user? What are the problems in performance? What are the mechanical issues? And what about the station and, and its condition? For the customer or end user, we gather end user information to update our records and create the profile we need to associate with the pump. From here, we begin with the more detailed questions related to the issues for the call. But here's a hint. The nameplate data that is usually located on the pump has the critical information for the pump's profile. Key data is located here. The flow, the head, the speed is even notated. Also the model number, which is important for us to know exactly what we're dealing with. And the all important serial number. <clears throat> the serial number is important to communicate uh, to us and us to communicate with the factory for key parts associated to the pump makeup. Other data can also be listed on the pump, like the pump weight, and in this case, the impeller lift. We also, if we don't have that information from the tag, we begin to ask more detailed questions from the customer. We ask as much as we can to find the information that they can provide, such as any data collected with the flow and head. Were any readings taken on AMTRA when the problem was discovered? There's a good correlation with that. And how long has the issue existed? When did it start? How was it noticed? On the mechanical issues, we ask, is the pump still working? Where is the suspected noise or vibration? When is the noise and vibration during operation? Is it during the startup, during the actual runtime, or is it intermittent? Again, we ask the question about the AMTRA. This all correlates together as we try to put together some of the issues that are being brought to us and what we can do to devise our plan in looking at this situation. We then ask another important part of the profile, which is about the station age and the pump age and about the history of any repairs that might have taken place on this particular unit. Not just when it took place, but also where on the pump was this repair done. Other details we ask that are very important about the station and the pump are, how many pumps are also in this station related to this pump? What is the history of the other pumps? Is this an isolated pump issue or an issue shared by other pumps in this station? Complexity of these machines requires as much information gathered at this point for a better perspective of what we will need moving forward. Now, here's some, what we call some bonus points. As we gather information directly from the end user, another valuable question we ask is, do you have access to the owner's manual or the pump submittal? This is a good go-to resource containing the entire makeup of the pump. Questions can be answered. Troubleshooting can be done when this is reviewed. It is also a great tool of knowledge for learning about the complexity of their vertical turbine pump. Now that we are this far in the process, it's time that I handed this over to Jason Popko. Okay, so um, this is where we start to dig in, right? So where we end up is we, we've taken that customer call and pretty much from here on out, uh, customer communication becomes critical in the decision-making process. Um, the question becomes, what is instigating that service call? Obviously, we, we just went through some of those ideas, you know, are we 
vibration? Do we have a, a low flow situation? Do we have an, an odd noise? Um, and, and one of the things that we probably want to explore first is, um, is a field assessment beneficial at this point? Um, we have the capability to come out to the station, to the pump, and, and kind of make some assessments as to what's going on. Um, you know, do we need to perform uh, vibration testing? Do we need to get a baseline for head and flow? Um, and really, some problems can be solved in the field. Uh, I remember on a on a recent field service call, we we had a customer who called in and said uh, their pump had developed a vibration problem. And uh, when we got out there and we started asking questions, uh, they had recently changed the motor. Um, and we said, well, maybe maybe it's not a pump issue. Uh, maybe maybe this is a motor thing from where they had the motor serviced. And what we found was that the, the motor was slightly out of balance and, and we did a field balancing and, and everything kind of returned to normal. Um, so we didn't have to pull that pump. Um, so all this is to say, a lot of times people will automatically jump to pulling that pump and sending it to the shop. Um, but, you know, we might want to consider, you know, is, is a field service investigation worth the time and the effort? Um, sometimes it definitely is. Um, so once we get past that and we get it into the shop, we can begin our disassembly and inspection process. Um, and again, customer communication is always critical. Um, and we, we get this thing in, we get it torn down, and, and we have to find out from the customer what, is the, what are the end user's needs at this point? Um, what are the circumstances surrounding this pump? Um, as, as I move forward, I'm gonna explain the, the repair and the recondition and the replacement ideas. And, and one of these things is, you know, what does the customer need right then? Uh, has, has something stopped working that they need to be working right away? Um, are they looking at a maintenance situation where, you know, we have a little bit of time? So uh, those, those are all good customer communication things that, that need to be considered. So, uh, before we move forward, I'm going to reiterate a definition of terms. Uh, Shane had went over those with us earlier, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that again because it, it certainly helps to make sure we're all speaking the same language. So a repair. Um, I got Marion Webster's uh, definition there. Um, we are replacing or restoring some part, right? We're, we're putting it back together from when it was broken. Um, the focus here being that we are fixing something that is broken uh, and getting it back into service, uh, hopefully as quickly as possible. Um, this is more often the case in the sewage. We, we have a lift station or something that, that goes awry, uh, but with vertical turbines, we're looking at raw water and we're looking at, you know, uh, water into the system, they, they might need this pump back immediately, in which case, if it stopped working, we're looking at a repair scenario. The recondition. Um, recondition is really pushing to get that pump back to a place where it has that new pump smell, right? Um, the, the goal here is to get the performance of the pump back to a like new condition. Uh, it's, it's far more involved than the, than the repair. And then the replacements. Um, sometimes a, a major component or the pump as a whole is just too far gone. Um, and, and this can kind of be a bittersweet situation. Uh, everyone likes new, uh, however, uh, new is kind of expensive and we would we would far prefer being in the position to uh, recondition or repair a pump than replace one. So uh, there again, it can be a bittersweet, but sometimes it's, it's unavoidable. So uh, let's jump into this deal. The replacement process is pretty straightforward, right? So I'm going to start with it. Um, we're looking to replace a pump or a major component with a new pump or major component that will give us a similar uh, performance to what we had before uh, we, we took the pump out. So we're looking for a like for like or as, as close as possible to a like for like performance for flow, head, and efficiency. There's obviously some other things that need to be considered here. We, we have to make sure that, uh, you know, things will fit up. We have a 
discharge elevations that we have to we have to make sure align up uh, we have motor sizes if if the motor's not being replaced we got to make sure that the the existing motor will work with the new pump so there's some considerations here but a replacement is really pretty straightforward it's the it's the simplest of the three the repair process is more involved than a replacement but it's it's really not overly complicated so um, let's uh, let's take a look at the the kind of the flow of a repair. Um, the typical flow path here is, uh, in the case of a true repair, there again speed being critical uh, and customer communication being critical here. Pretty much all these little uh, yellow arrows, we we need to make sure that we're communicating with a customer. Um, we're going to give a disassembly and inspection of the broken parts. Uh, we're looking to fix or replace the broken parts, moving into assembling and returning it to the customer. Um, a little bit of a note here, uh, a repair will often require some level of reconditioning. Uh, for example, if we have a bearing uh, that, that you know, needs to be replaced, uh, it's, it's great to put that new bearing in, but that new bearing won't work very well if it's in a, uh, a worn out hub or, or the hub itself is damaged. So uh, reconditioning of the hub might be required to correctly repair the bad bearing scenario. So the, the, the lines here aren't always uh, exclusively black and white. We, we get into some gray areas with the repair versus the recondition, just kind of as a, as a nature of the beast. So um, the last one and the uh, most involved one is the recondition. Uh, this is really where we like to see a lot of pumps. Um, you know, in my opinion, I'd like to see it more, uh, get some of these pumps out there. Uh, so let's look at the, at the flow of this. Um, so what we have here is kind of a typical flow sequence for a recondition. Uh, we start in a similar way with a disassembly and inspection. But the inspection is far more detailed. Um, we inspect all the major parts. We're recording and documenting a lot of the, the clearances and other things. Um, and then this inspection is delivered over to a project engineer. Um, project engineer will sit down. He'll analyze it. He's going to run the numbers on the clearances for your parts and pieces. He's going to get some good pictures. He's going to compile a full report and it's it's a formal report that we send over to the owner and within that report we have a scope of supply what we're looking at is a is a repair scope that is not really repairing the pump but a reconditioning of the pump so um we we review that with the owner and again all these little yellow arrows, these are all areas where we need to talk to the customer. We need to establish what it is that, that we're doing, what it is that the customer needs us to do. Um, at the end of the day, I, I could lay out a perfect recondition, but it, it might not be what, what the end user needs. And, and we have to take that into consideration. Really, we're, we're here to service the customer. So um, the owner gets this report and we discuss it. Uh, sometimes they'll come out and they'll they'll see what we have on the ground. They they want to touch and see it with their own eyes, um, and then they they set us loose and say, okay, let's let's get this thing reconditioned. Um, we we go ahead and we get the key components and parts ordered or fabricated, and then we we set off to putting this pump together and and getting it delivered off to the customer. And then that's pretty much a common flow for the recondition. Um, as a note. One of the things that we do really well is uh, we have access to some very nice equipment that, that allows us to really perform reconditions on, on a big scale with really high accuracy. Um, what you're looking at here, this is a picture of the WOTAN. This is a, a horizontal boring mill. Uh, from my understanding, uh, it's the biggest in the Southwest that is dedicated exclusively to the municipal water market. Um, it's, if, if you ever get a chance to come visit us firsthand, I encourage it. This is a really cool piece of equipment to look at. Um, this machine allows us to measure and machine to accuracy levels in the thousandths of an inch. Um, the spindle moves up, down, left, and right. 
the table moves uh, 360 degrees. It spins in a, in a flat horizontal plane there. Uh, and the end result is we have the ability to take a component like a discharge head or a column pipe, and we can, we can fabricate those components with near-perfect parallelism, uh, perpendicularity, and concentricity. Um, so when, when we start talking about the reconditioning of this, we can take some of these old parts and we can put them in and we can find out exactly where they're out. Uh, the, the little down here in the right hand photo, you see that little red probe, that's the little ruby head on our, on our probe. We can find out exactly where it's out. If, if the parallelism is out a little bit or if the concentricity is out, we'll know that. This thing uh, is, is just incredible at identifying where the surfaces are and, and how these planes all line up in space. So um, we also have both CNC and manual lathes. Uh, this allows us to produce one-off custom components uh, on a manual lathe, as well as uh, batches of highly consistent interchangeable components on our CNC lathe. Um, and again, these, these are all right here you know, within our facility, so you can come over and see them. Um, another key component to a very good uh, reconditioning is balancing, and impeller balancing is critical. If you've ever uh, seen a pump that had an impeller that was out of balance, you know it. You certainly heard it, I can almost promise you. Um, and, and we can address those those critical measurements and balance, as well as uh, shaft straightening too. So we can get everything lined up. Uh, alignment is, plays a very critical role in our reconditioning. So um, the probably the, the last piece of this puzzle that we have here is our fabrication abilities. Um, and oftentimes what we do is we work with our fabrication uh, capabilities in conjunction with our horizontal boring mill. So what we can do is we can take a head or we can take columns or bowls. We can, we can take some of these big major components uh, and instead of saying, okay, well, we have to replace them, we can, we can pad weld them. We can, we can weld up some of these registers and, and these other things, um, send them out for heat treat, and then bring them back in and put them in that horizontal uh, boring mill. And we can reestablish those services to reestablish the parallelism and the concentricity. Um, I've had to do this a few times. Uh, I, I wouldn't have thought, you know, previously that, that a piece of equipment of any size could actually move itself out. Uh, but it does. It happens over time, and and some of the lifespans of this equipment are, are pretty long. Um, we also have our own blasting and, and painting capabilities right here in our facility, which which gives us the ability to turn around and protect those those services uh, pretty quickly after we've we've machined them. So um, we we have the full lineup right here within our own house to to really do a pretty good job on this reef on these uh, reconditioning of these pumps. So um, here we are back to uh, the reconditioning and repair. And the, the final fourth piece of this puzzle really is, I've said it a few times, communication, communication, um, regardless of the kind of service that we are providing, uh, the most important piece of this puzzle is, is solid communication between us and the end user. Um, we need to know exactly what is necessary. If, if we're in an emergency situation and we need water, uh, we, wanna, we wanna pursue that repair vigorously. Um, we don't wanna spend the extra time taking all the extra measurements and, and chasing out all the clearances uh, if, if you need water right now. That's it's just not an appropriate response. At the same time, if you, if you have sent us in a pump that's in the off season, um, I don't need to shoot it through the, the repair shop on a rocket. We, we need to take some time and we need to recondition this thing, uh, get it back to where it's operating at the optimal, um, get you the efficiency you need to, to keep your power costs down and, and extend the life of that equipment. So um, communication is always gonna be key. Um, and then kind of to, to wrap up my portion of the presentation, um, the reality is in most cases, when we get these pumps in, 
we end up performing a combination of a repair or recondition. Uh, we're we're not blind to the fact that you know municipalities have budgets and and other things that they have to do, so we're trying to put out the best possible product back to the customer that we can with with the resources at hand, um, and and then in some cases, unfortunately, uh, it's a combination of all three. We we may have to replace a bowl assembly, and we can recondition you know, all the other components and then repair a, a component that was actually broken in the process of the operation of the pump. Um, so that kind of wraps up my portion of it. Um, from here, uh, we have more fun stuff. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Granger Smith. A lot of you guys know him. Uh, so Granger, uh, whenever you're ready, sir. Hey, thanks, Jason. Let me get my screen shared here. Um, and I noticed that you didn't introduce yourself. So I'll tell you guys a little bit about Jason. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be nice. <laughs> uh, he's uh, Jason is in charge of the group of project managers, project engineers that, that handle these repairs for us. So very knowledgeable, seen a lot of things. They deal with a lot of stuff all the time. And um, so, and then, if you haven't met me before, I'm one of the originals. I've, I've been here quite a while, not as long as some people. That might be surprising to you, but I think I'm at my 39th year at this, this point. So <clears throat> I've got a presentation that could almost be called a case study, but not quite because I picked a pump that's going through our shop. Um, and so we don't have the final results but we have all the ingredients of a recondition and we have a story about uh, the repair part that I'd like to share with you. And, you know, we picked the vertical turbine pump because uh, there's so many of them. Uh, they come in all sizes. Um, and today, at least in water and wastewater, we see turbine pumps more places than we see just about any other type. Um, and they look simple, right? And that's a deceiving thing because they're really not. There is quite a bit to this, um, especially when you start thinking about uh, the kind of runs that you might expect. And I tried to quantify that this way. You know, if you build this pump correctly, if you design it right, build it right, if it gets installed right and is operated properly, you know, what should you expect for that first run that meantime between repair, five years, 10 years, it could be as much as 20 years. It really depends on the severity of the service. Um, but if all things are done right to start with, um, in reality, you should expect at least 10 years. Uh, that's been my experience. Uh, they should go 10 years between uh, repairs. And you know, at some point they have to come out of service uh, just because of wear. And, and I'll say that the equipment that we primarily uh, uh, work on for municipalities is equipment that's designed to last 20 or 30 years. Now, I don't see many 50 year old turbines, but I've seen a few um, and I've seen a lot that are 30 years old. So, um, but at some point they all need to come out of service either because they're off on flow they're noisy, they got vibration or temperature, some combination of this. And, um, and then you say, hey, I need some major maintenance. So what do you get when you ask for a pump repair? Our customers call us and they say, we're taking telephone bids on a repair. Um, and you, you don't really have much more information than that. And that is, kind of a wild card because it can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. And <clears throat> in the example, um, I've got, you know, a, a pretty complicated pump here in this GA drawing. And I want to point out how complicated this, this pump really is from a, a manufacturing standpoint, from an operating standpoint. You know, the, the work is done at the bottom by the bowl. Uh, but there's a line shaft going up to the top. I know this one to be oil loop, so there's an enclosing tube around it. Um, there's bearings in that enclosing tube. I've got a lower column that looks different than the intermediate columns. 
I've got an upper column that looks different than all the other columns, and I've got a discharge head. Um, so that's a lot. And if you look at the bill of materials for this pump, you know, basically when we get a pump in our shop, we're getting items two through 16, you know, from the bowl assembly all the way down to a lot of the bolting. And I've got quantities up here. And if you add all those quantities up, that's 57 parts, uh, not counting bolts. If we counted bolts, it would be much bigger. Um, and that's when I count the bowl as one. And we know that there's a lot of parts in a bowl assembly. And so if you just stop and take stock, um, a vertical turbine pump is all about how all those components fit together. And if they're machined right, if all the bores are on the same center line, if all the machine mating surfaces are perpendicular to that center line, you know, those are the things that make this equipment run for quite a while. Um, and I would say uh, with a pump like this, at least, you can't find a different style pump that's got more parts than this. You really can't. And so at the end of the day, the key goal for a long run, whether it's the first run or after the repair, the second run is good alignment transfer between components. That's what it's all about. We can drill down and look at the bowl. I can count 21 parts in here. I mean, you probably recognize the suction bell, the bowl, the top case. Um, there's an impeller. There could be wear rings here, although that's not shown. There's a shaft and there's some bearings. Uh, there's just quite a bit to that. And all of that has to be made right to work. And so that alignment transfer is just kind of a recurring theme here. Um, if we move up above the bowl, that uh, upper assembly just above the bowl, we call the port body assembly. It's made up of the loader, lower column, a fabricated port body uh, with port tube uh, that includes a throttle bearing. And it's not shown here, but there's an enclosing tube around this shaft that starts at this elevation and goes up. So, you know, these are all the parts that make up this assembly. And they all are machined. They all have to fit right. And if they don't, equipment won't last. Um, if we look at a column section as an assembly, you've of course got the column pipe itself. Uh, you've got the shaft and the shaft coupling. Of course, there's an enclosing tube that goes around it, um, a bearing that also acts as a tube connector, and you've got O-rings and you've got bolting. And you have several of these. I think I count four on this pump uh, that are just intermediate columns. So again, I can't say it enough how all this stuff is made, assembled, has everything to do with how well it runs or how long it runs. Um, this is just a blow up on the shaft coupling assembly to show that there are parts to it as well that just connect the two shafts. And that's probably one of the most important connections we have because now you've got a shaft that you're trying to transmit uh, its center to the next shaft up. All of those dimensions have to be tight, but not too tight in order to do that properly. So all these parts. Um, and the alignment transfer comes up again. We get up to the top, we got a discharge head. You know, there's a, a head itself. There's a tension nut bearing assembly where the tube uh, connects to the head and the shaft comes out. It's a motor coupling and all kinds of fasteners, but lots of machine surfaces on that part as well. So guess what? Alignment transfer is important there as well. So, I mean, at this point, you've shown me all these parts and pieces for a vertical turbine pump, and I just want to repair. Uh, what does all this have to do with a repair? What do you do when you get, when you ask for just a pump repair? Um, which is what most of our customers start out with is, I need you to repair my pump. Well, what is a repair? Well, by definition, and, and Jason and Shane have already spoke to this, you know, it's as little as replacing the bearings and replacing the wear rings, and that's it. And, and you know, and, and once you realize that if you ask for a repair and you get bids from various places and that's all they have to go with, it's everybody's definition beyond that, how much further you go. And so you can see a big variation in cost. 
And so I've talked about these mating surfaces a lot. And I just want to point out a few things. Uh, this is a drawing on, um, this is the pump that I've got the example on, but you can see the, the bearing housing bore here and it's got a dimension to three decimal places and that circle and that number means that it uh, needs to be concentric uh, with another surface to within five thousandths of an inch. And that other surface is that male register that you see right there that has three decimal places, three numbers to the right of the decimal place. And we have a tolerance of only two thousandths between right on and two thousandths. And we know from experience that that part has to be that precisely made to give good life. And if you look at the other side, there's the female register there and you see it's got a little bit of clearance, but not a heck of a lot. 008 versus 002, about six thousandths is the minimum clearance that it would have. Um, and so, you know, that's just talking about these column pipes and some of these other terms up here near the top, I hope you're seeing my cursor. I can't see it, it keeps going away, is we want those machined flange faces to be flat within three thousandths and to be parallel to the other side within three thousandths. And when you get into how do you do that, it turns out it's not real easy. Well, a column is simple compared to a head. It's got more machine surfaces and so is even much more complicated and the fact that it's a fabrication, even if you go through the process, process of stress relieving, over time, all of, those, uh, all of those concentric machine surfaces and those flange faces do tend to move over time. So <clears throat> this pump is going through our shop now. This is out back of our shop before we tore it down. The customer brought us this part of it, it's a two-stage bowl and a short piece of column, and there's a column missing and a discharge head. Now, this thing was put in service in the mid-90s. It was one of 26 pumps on a 156-mile pipeline, and I might just stop and say this isn't my repair project. It's a guy named Joe Bondison's. Uh, Joe's on this call, so Joe, I hope I've interpreted everything you gathered together correctly here. You can tell me later. Um, but it was a good example. This pump is mounted in a suction barrel. Um, it was pulled to service because it was running well and then all of a sudden had high vibration. And that's always a clue. We don't normally get this information, but this is so valuable. Um, it has 60,000 hours on it. The last repair we did in 2011, it was 52,000 52, hours. You know, you can see the size of the motor uh, as well there. So pretty good size equipment. That's the model and serial number. Uh, Byron Jackson uh, brand is now part of FlowServe and that 93 means that they built that pump in 1993. So we're coming up on a 30 year pump here in a couple of years. Um, because of the reported vibration problem, we asked the customer to bring us the rest of the pump. So we got the head, the column, uh, the stuff in box, the coupling um, as well. And it's a point that I wanted to make that if our goal is to really return this to as new condition, which um, I've already told you, if everything's right, you should expect to get 10 years of life. And if you expect the repair to get 10 years of life, you have to go back to as new uh, tolerances to be able to expect that. And so it's important to look at all the parts in this case. Here's a good view of the pump, um, some of the specs on it. It looks pretty simple, right? Well, when you dig in and you start looking at the sectional drawing, you see a lot more parts and pieces to it, but it's not bad because there's only one line shaft bearing, there's no shaft and closing tube. So compared to the first example I gave you, it is pretty simple. Um, and we'll start by showing a series of pictures with the suction bell first. Um, this isn't exactly the order they get tore down, but this is the way I like to talk about it. And you can look inside and look at the first stage impeller and see the impeller veins. And from this view, I might be seeing some shiny spots, but I don't see any 
pitting or anything like that. Uh, we've got a little better shot here. I can see that there are shiny spots, but they look smooth to me. Um, you know, the, there, there's enough turbulence there to, to knock the scale off of the, of the impeller, but it's not putting pits in the impeller. So that's, that's good for a pump coming up on 30 years. Here's a view of the impeller after it's pulled out. It's a semi-open impeller. There's no shroud on the bottom, so you see the veins. I uh, see some um, lines on the veins, so I think they've been rubbing a little bit. And then here's the impeller sitting down in its liner, and that fit between the end of that vein and that liner is critical. And from this view, it looks like it's, uh, the contours are, are very well. You can see the wear ring on the top. That's really a balance ring because it's on the top, not the bottom, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. But um, the interesting thing about this is we tore this whole thing down. I can't make this a really long story. We don't have time, but um, we found kind of a smoking gun. There was one bearing to shaft journal area uh, that shows up in the top of the bowl assembly where the red arrow is that was very damaged, uh, lots of heat on the shaft, lots of scoring on the shaft and, and the uh, bearing bore. And so, you know, it's a bronze bearing. We're pumping the fluid that uh, the pump pumps to lubricate the bearing, which is like water. It's a raw water application. There's a spiral groove in there. So it looks worse than it actually is because that groove is in there for being a trash channel to let trash fall in and, and find its way out. But, you know, the fact that we've seen so much heat on the shaft makes us want to replace it. Uh, so the bow, the bow shaft needs to be replaced. Obviously the bearing does too. Uh, it's a pretty good size shaft. It's a four and a half inch shaft, 410 stainless steel. So this will be an expensive part. We don't make these decisions lightly because of how much they cost to replace. Uh, you know, first thing you look at when you're trying to figure out why this happened is shaft straightness. We saw 6,000 run out, um, you know, ideal is three or less. Yeah, it's a little bit out, but it's not the source of our problem. Um, <clears throat> since there was nothing else obvious about um, why this pump would vibrate, we're hanging our hat on this connection uh, or this clearance between the bearing and the shaft. Uh, we think that they that the, the bearing grew and tried to gall to the to the shaft as it was turning. But going through all the process of you know just looking at parts and pieces, there's a lot of measurement that goes on to make sure all of these mating parts are made right and are put together and are in alignment and straight. And the first thing we start with are the bearing to shaft um, clearances, the bearing bore to the shaft OD, the shaft journal. And guess what? The first and second stage both had excessive clearance. Um, obviously the second stage was where the failure occurred uh, or the reason the customer pulled the pump. Um, not sure that that is really indicating the root cause of this problem. It just kind of confirms that, hey, we had enough looseness to where a shaft and a bearing could make contact with, with each other. So two bearings need to be replaced. The suction case bearing is, is fine. When you see that and you don't see one-sided wear on a shaft, it's a good indication that there's not much misalignment in the machine stationary parts either um, because you don't see the one-sided wear um, or the huge amount of wear. So just moving right along, so now I'm looking, I've got the impeller pulled um, out of the second stage. I'm looking at the liner and then back down to where the first stage um, bowl would be. And that liner is in good shape. I can see where the impeller sat on it and knocked off the scale, but I don't see a lot of grooving. And I'm pulling up pieces of Joe's report and just hitting the highlights here, but in the end, the impellers were fine. The liners were fine. We had some slack grooving, um, but everything was reusable after we polished it up and looked at it real close. So <clears throat> just 
continuing on, um, you know, that fit with that impeller is good, but it's not all visual. We have to go in and look at the wear ring clearance. And this top ring is, is really a balance ring to reduce the axial thrust. You can see the holes going through the impeller uh, in by the hub. Um, we're looking for tolerances that are pretty tight, 22 to 28 thousandths of clearance between that rotating wear ring there and the stationary ring in the case. And we're, uh, we're within spec, we're good. Don't really see any issues there that might cause this. Um, the impeller bore to shaft was out a little bit. You know, we like to see four thousandths clearance or less. We saw five. Well, the shaft has to be replaced. We're just gonna fix that when we um, replace the shaft so that it has the right kind of clearance fit. Um, we looked at the diffuser case and we can see signs of 30 years because we see corrosion. Um, and we see areas that we filled last time with corrosion for corrosion that probably need to be refilled again. But all this is, is repairable, so they're in decent condition. Um, line shaft inspection. Um, I think we looked at the runouts and didn't see any issues on uh, any of the shafts, but uh, we did see enough pitting in the shaft and rubbing on the shaft journals where we've recommended replacing, um, I think the other shaft, I think there's two shafts in this pump. Um, <clears throat> we get into the column register inspection and, and this becomes kind of an interesting thing because we didn't do this in 2011. We didn't check these um, and the pump ran 10 years, but um, I'm not sure that this is this may be part of the problem here that we had when this vibration started. But you can see the impeller liner has some clearance that's outside of spec. And the second case to bottom column alignment is out of spec. And then I think the next slide maybe has the column inspection parts. Um, so we've got some issues to fix there. I don't really see smoking guns with these pieces of information. But let's get back to the primary issue. Um, the <clears throat> second stage case mail register was repaired and remachined in 2011. And we repaired it with a metal repair compound. And when we took that joint apart, it broke apart. You can see that in the bottom picture. Um, not sure if that is the problem, but we're saying, hey, maybe that was the problem we're gonna do a different repair this time and we're gonna weld up that register and remachine it so that it's got a better chance of being there in 10 years. Um, so other issues that came up, um, you know, here's where we're looking at the machining accuracy of the columns and the heads. And we didn't do this in 2011. And here are the tolerances we look for for concentricity and parallelism. And the uh, discharge head is first. I guess we're starting at the top working down, uh, but there was a column aligning register to the motor register, um, motor aligning register that was out by seven thousandths and a column flange face to motor mounting surface that was out nine thousandths in parallelism. You know, that's a long way from that bearing, but it's enough that you want to fix it. Um, not sure it has anything to do with the high vibration. But when we go to the column, we see the top column and the bottom column both have issues with concentricity and the top column has a parallelism issue as well. And 28 thousandths is a lot. Um, that's, that's a big number. And so I'm not sure that that's part of our problem, but we believe if we go back and, and correct that register in the second stage case and correct these machining issues that we found, that the pump will truly be at what we call a recondition level or, or grade when we get done. Um, and so in summary, what I would say is, you know, most pumps that are over 10 years old require a recondition 
to get them back to as new tolerances. A basic repair will not allow the best run after that repair is done, and it won't be as long as the first run. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Shane. So Shane, it's yours, all yours, man. Thank you, Granger. And let me see if I can get this screen. Thank you, Granger, and thank you, Jason, for your part of the presentation. Let me see if I can pull mine back up. And we'll get going. Folks, we only have just a few more slides to share with you, and our presentation will be completed. We do appreciate your time with us today. This is the basic summary. Granger had a summary of what he discussed, but overall, just a broader perspective of what we discussed today. What is the reason for the pump service? You know, we provide a condition assessment, and then we, we go to the three paths, which will be either a repair or recondition or a replacement. If it's a repair and the pump is not operable, you know, we go through the repair process as we discussed. And if it's a recondition, the pump is operable, but not operating at optimal levels, we'll go through a recondition process. And as Granger and as Jason explained, in some cases, a repair might lead into a recondition process. Then of course, when, this, when the processes are completed, the pump service is completed to that particular pump. Or in other words, if we do a condition assessment, we may find that a replacement is, is necessary and then we provide that as an opportunity. We give the customer information of their pump condition, whether a need for the repair or recondition, or as a final solution, a replacement. By giving the customer all the options, it allows for a more qualified decision by the customer of which is the more logical choice for their situation. So we've come to the end of this presentation and we thank you, you've lasted this long. So it's time for a little uh, Q&A. So what questions do you have related to our approach to repair and condition? Ian, do you, do you have that up? And I'll, I'll let you. Feel. Yeah, Jason did a pretty good job of knocking out most of the answers on some of these questions already, but I guess we could probably expand a little bit more. Um, one guy asked, is testing before and after the repair, recondition or replacement always recommended? Um, Jason, you kind of hit a couple points testing is not always required before service, um, but I believe you state that after service is required, we generally try to do startup and performance. Do you want to expand on that anymore? Yeah, it's it's really, um, it, it varies from one to the next. Uh, if, we, if we have a system out there that's really good at collecting, you know, the head, the flow, the temperature, amps, um, you know, just some of those variables that we look for, um, and, and it captures them in, in the system and we can draw that report. Um, we can get the information that we need. We can, we can see the trends as to kind of what the pump is doing at any given time. Um, but then on the flip side, when we go back out, that's really one of our final quality measures. Um, when we start that pump up, is it running the way that we want it to? Do we, do we have those low vibrations? Are we meeting those heads and flows? Um, is our amp draw look good? You know, that's, that's really part of what we pride ourselves in is, is the ability to take that thing, put it back into the hole and say, oh, here we go. We're, we're good until, you know, the next five, six, seven years uh, until we need to see it again. And, and, you know, the efficiencies and everything should be where they need to be to ensure that, you know, your power consumption is, is appropriate. So um, that, that's one of those areas that, yes, we, we would like to see that after um, every repair, but it's, it's not necessary before every repair if, if the circumstances are, are there. If not, there's, there's some of the smaller ones out there um, that don't have those capabilities, and, and we would like to get out there and take some baselines just to make sure we, we know what's going on out there as well. Next question, uh, you marked that you wanted to answer live, but then you put a question, an answer in there as well. Um, yeah, that's because I didn't know what I was doing there. <laughs> <laughs> Do the turnaround times differ on repairs versus reconditions? Um, you said generally, yes, uh, speed is critical on repairs, and our goal is to return the pump to service. Uh, full recondition is more involved and generally takes longer. Um, 
Does that pretty much hit the high points? You want to continue going? Yeah, that, that pretty much is it. You can expect a recondition is going to take a little bit longer. Um, it's it's more involved, like I said in the presentation, and we're really doing a, a lot more formal reporting there. We, we want to give the customer something to say, okay, this is where your pump is whenever we received it. And then, um, you know, we can compare that against where it's at whenever we're completed. So um, it, it's a more formal process. The recondition definitely takes longer. Um, we're, we're putting a lot more time on, on the engineering side into that product, so. Okay, and what happens if a column pipe is not aligned properly? Oh, we're shake, rattle and roll, baby. <laughs> um, we, if we get out, if we get alignments out, uh, what we're going to see is, is, uh, high vibrations. If you, if you don't see it directly, if you get it just a little bit out, you're going to see some one-sided wear on shafts and bearings. Uh, in extreme cases, I've seen it to where it just wears through a bearing and, and you end up with a, with a rattle can, something cuts loose of a flow and the, and the head fall to zero, um, and, and the motor just spins and you hear a really nasty ruckus. Um, if, if you've never got to experience it, I, I don't recommend it. It's, it's pretty bad. So yeah, misalignment is, is definitely an, an enemy to the longevity of equipment. So. Okay, since you answered the other questions already on the Q&A section, I'm going to skip over to some that haven't been answered. Um, okay. Are Smith pump repairs as good as OEMs? Um, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, we, we pride ourselves in this. Um, for FlowServe, we, uh, for actually for all those guys that we represent, we are a certified repair center. Um, and they actually come to us. FlowServe is, is a pretty big partner for us. We actually build equipment for them as well. We, we built uh, components that, that build those pumps. Um, and, and we get you know, requests from across the state to actually build discharge heads and column pipes at time for, for other manufacturers as well. Um, so yes, I have complete faith in, in the fact that our repairs and, and reconditions are as good and, and in some cases exceed uh, the OEM products. Um, one of the things that we, we really shine at is we have the ability to do our own modeling. Uh, we have a guy on my staff named Larry Wingo, who, who's really just quite brilliant. Um, and, and he does an incredible job at doing some of those FEA analysis. So um, if, if I get a, a new project in here where I get to design the head from scratch, uh, Larry Wingo is my right-hand man, and, uh, and we tend to do really, really well at it. So um, yes, uh, Smith Pump repairs are as good as OEMs by, by all means. So. Okay, and the final question we have for today uh, in terms of time probably is, can you recommend metrics that an operator should track to determine the best time to recondition a pump? Um, head and flow are the big ones. Uh, when, when you get a new pump, uh, you get a curve. Uh, we typically do factory testing with most of what we sell. Um, so you have an idea of where that head and flow is. Um, if you see a, a fall off in head and flow, then, then you know that you're seeing some components that are wearing, you're having some clearances that are opening up. Um, the other one is vibration. Uh, if, you're, if you're seeing an increase in vibration, uh, that can be an indication that you're having some wear components that are getting loose and, and the tolerances are, are getting out there. So um, right off the top of my head, I would say uh, head flow and, and vibration um, would, would be the big three. Uh, and, and then there's obviously for the motor, you got temperature. Temperature is a big one for the motor. You, you can really see what's going on uh, if, if you're monitoring temperatures as well, so. You mentioned vibration. There was another one that came in about harmonic vibration. Can you oh, address that in terms of that or is that a different oh, topic man. for another day? Um, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll brush up against it just briefly, but that is really a, a, a topic in of itself. Um, that, that gets quite involved. Um, when, you, when you start looking at vibration, if you have a harmonic vibration issue, you have a, a vibration or um, you have a design on a, on a pump where it's, it's exciting itself at a run speed, you definitely have a problem. Um, you probably, 
I, I don't see that happening real often after the fact. Normally, you know about a, a, a read critical frequency is what we refer to that as uh, right out of the gate. Um, you, you, when we do a startup, we, we always do the vibration testing that goes with it. Um, and normally we identify those those pretty quickly. Um, those problems can be resolved. Uh, there, there's, you know, various approaches to doing it. Um, but that really, that that whole subject is, uh, we could sit here and talk for two hours about that's, that's a subject in of itself. Uh, Alan, if you, if you want to, if you want to talk, we can, we can pull up a chair for lunch or something and, and we can roll through it. You're more than welcome to come hang out with us. Uh, I got uh, two guys on my staff that, that would absolutely love to sit down and, and wear you out about it. And even the, the president of the company and uh, Trent Brown and then, and then the owner Granger Smith are really well versed in this subject. Um, so if you want to come join us, we'll be more than happy to, to maybe have a slice of pizza and, and go over it. All right. Thanks, guys. I think that's probably about as much time as we got for the day. Um, I appreciate everybody joining us today. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Thank you, everyone, for participating. We're sorry we went a little bit over, but we hope the information provided today will enhance your understanding of a, a repair and a recondition. Uh, we will continue to have our webinars on a monthly basis. Please look for other invitations and other uh, topics related to pumps. And uh, we hope to see you again real soon. Thank you and have a great day.